You know, a lot of the, the B2C tech giants of the US are very stagnant. Facebook mm -hmm. hasn't invented anything in a decade. Neither has Apple. If it's on B2C, if it's an app on a smartphone, it's probably better in China. You know, I'm an American. The regulations we see out of the US are incredibly stupid. The TikTok discussion is, yeah. is idiotic. E-commerce in China dwarfs. You take all the e-commerce spending of China, that's number one in the world. Number two would be the US. Then it's like UK, Japan. If you take two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, add them all up, money spent per year, it's less than China. What is your greatest lesson from close interaction with Warren? Like, I mean, I didn't, I was like, wait a minute, like Cherry Coke right next to me. And sure enough, he's like, thanks everybody. And he stands up and walks over and sits next to me. I never hear of value investors doing something like that. Something a little spooky going on. Jeffrey Towson is a consultant, investor, and keynote speaker specializing in digital strategy and transformation. He is also a best-selling author, the founder of TechMo Consulting, and the host of Tech Strategy Podcast. As a former professor at Peking University, he once led two groups of students to meet and learn directly from Warren Buffett. Today, it's my honor to have Jeffrey on the show to dive into insights about tech giants in China and his experience with Warren Buffett. Before we continue, let me introduce you to today's sponsor. Thanks to their support, I can continue to create valuable content like this for you for free. And the sponsor today is no stranger. I've been sharing with you many times before because it's a credible trading platform, Okta a globally regulated CFD broker with zero commissions and fast withdrawals. Just like investing, trading can be a lifelong journey that should be taken seriously. Okta can be your reliable partner, providing a comprehensive approach for each of your trading milestones. Once you assess the platform, you will find it incredibly comprehensive, offering over 300 trading instruments, including stocks, currencies, precious metals, and more. Most importantly, Okta offers the best trading condition on the market, spreads as low as 0.8 on majors, no swaps, leverage 1 to 500. Download the app and see it for yourself. Clients' money is always easily credited and they can withdraw their fund within one hour whenever they want. In fact, Okta won the award for broker with the fastest withdrawal Singapore 2023. With 12 years of experience, Okta now boasts 40 million active trading accounts in over 180 countries. It also provides you with a lot of free educational resources to help you to sharpen your trading skill. When your trading skills become stable, that's how you can potentially generate consistent income from the market, giving you more time and resources to pursue what truly matters to you the most, like spending time with the loved ones. Interested in starting your trading journey with Okta? Simply download the app from the link in the description below or by scanning the QR code here. Remember to use my promo code ALIGATO100 to double your deposit. With that, let's get back to the video. Can you share with us a little bit more about your background? Because I know that you have been actually living in China for some time. Uh, what makes you actually go to China and, and how has the pro process been so far? Yeah, I've been in China since about 2007. Um, I've been working internationally. I came out of the US, but I've been working internationally, Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Europe, um, Asia, about 20 years. And, you know, it was pretty clear early on that I was working for a Saudi prince, a guy named Al-Walid, mm -hmm. who is, um, he, when I was working for him, he was the world's fourth richest person. And he was kind of the biggest business person of Saudi Arabia. So I was kind of one of his dudes. Um, and then anyways, it was pretty clear that China was where the action was and Asia was where the future was. So I, I moved over there and um, that was for business. And I, I never really left. Uh, I fly back and forth a lot. And my little area of interest is a digital strategy, which is that's a digital business, Tencent. That's a digital business, Amazon. Can you anticipate what's going to happen, that they're going to win, they're in trouble? Um, but it turns out most business, and Asia is very good for that because Chinese digital companies are world class. Mm. You know? Um and that leads into things like consulting because most businesses are becoming digital. So yeah, those are you know pure breeds, but pretty much not every business, but most businesses are becoming digital creatures to some degree. It's everything in China right now, tech is so ingrained in everyone's life. Like 
even beggar, they accept Alipay, all right, or WeChat Pay to, to get, accept the donations and all this. So why do you think that China has transformed so quickly, which in fact, in my opinion, overtook a lot of developing uh, developed countries like Japan and even including US, right? So what makes China such a wonderful place in embracing tech like this? I mean, you, there's there's the bigger story, which is the development of China, which is its own subject. And there's a lot of reasons why that is happening. Uh, I've written a couple of books on that. The digital story is a little bit more specific. If it's on B2C, business to consumer, if it's an app on a smartphone, it's probably better in China by a lot. Like it's not close. If it's B2B, if it's enterprise, if we're talking about Microsoft Teams, it's probably better in the US still. Uh, mm. They tend to be further down the path on that side. So you kind of got to do it case by case to get a sense. We go back to 2012, 2013, 2015, people were not talking about Chinese apps. Yep. Okay, the whole world kind of knows now that, hey, mobile payment's really awesome. Hey, TikTok is awesome. Like she and Timu, Ali. Now people kind of know, but that was five years ago. That wasn't really, people weren't really aware. You go to Brazil now, everybody uses TikTok. Mm. And she and, and now Kwai Show is there, which is kind of cool. Um, wow. So it's not as surprising to people as it used to be. And now they're kind of waking up this year. Usually, the, I'll, I'll give a, quick, a simple answer. In digital China, if it's about consumers or it's about manufacturing, it's probably better. Smart refrigerators are better in China than they are in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, smartphones, with the exception of the iPhone, which really yeah. the handset is kind of dumpy. Like it's not impressive. Look at a Huawei Mate 50, that thing's awesome, right? <laughs> if it's manufacturing plus digital, it's probably better there for most things. And, and the world is kind of recognizing this week, really, that Chinese electric vehicles, have you seen the new BYD supercar, the Yang Wang or whatever? Wow, that thing's unbelievable. Like, Oh my gosh. Go look at the videos. That thing, Xiaomi has their new SU7. Like, so usually if it's in one of those two buckets or both, Mm -hmm. You know, you can kind of put your money on China and you'll probably be right most of the time. Not always, most of the time. So the thing is, like, is it because the government gave a lot of support to those, these tech digital enterprise and that's why it grew so quickly? If not, how? It's, it's a combination of factors. Um, there are certainly cases where there is a top-down directive that matters. When the Chinese government said, we are gonna support solar and wind 20 years ago, mm. that had a major impact on you know, this wave of Chinese solar companies that, that are still now very dominant. Sometimes it's top down. Uh, that was much, you know, other times it's kind of like, no, no, nobody saw it coming. It was purely a bottom up phenomenon of a lot of highly innovative people Mm. shocked everybody. And in that case, actually, the government is usually running to catch up and understand mm. like what's happening in P2P credit. I mean, that was a big deal in China five years ago that caught kind of everyone by surprise. It wasn't had a lot of problems. So sometimes it's bottom up. Um, it's just a really big economy and you have a lot of consumers and they have a quick adoption rate. You have a mm. huge amount of brain power yeah so with all those new technology coming in do government uh does the chinese government generally support or do they more like trying to control and maybe trying to catch up no it's it's funny to watch it like it's usually a game like 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 remember when bike sharing came out yeah which, you know in the matter of a couple months there was these yellow you know, for Ofo and the gray ones for mobile. In a couple months, they were everywhere on every yeah. street. You couldn't walk down the street. Like you had to push your way through all these friggin' bikes. Okay. In any other country, that would have been stopped within a day. New York City would not have allowed that. Right. 
China kind of let it run. Like you see that pattern, if it's not related to credit, which is a, a worrying area, mm. you will often see that the government is very aware and they will let it run for a, maybe a year or two before they, they don't want to stifle the innovation. Mm. And then in a year or two after, they will generally step in. That's what happened with like ride sharing and DD and Quidi. Yep. You know, that was not technically legal in China for quite some time. Mm. And everyone's like, yeah, it's okay. But then they eventually stepped in with some regulations. They will give them room to run and to innovate. And, but eventually they will step in, right? Uh, mm. Especially if it's like credit or if it's related to media, like Totiao, the government stepped in very quickly. Yeah. Uh, but most countries don't allow you to do that. You can't put 50,000 bicycles on the sidewalks of a capital city, just do it. The government, the cops are gonna call you in a day and they're like, what are you doing? Um, China kind of let that happen. Uh, we see amazing. that pattern a lot. Wow, that's amazing. So basically, you don't think that they get approval from the government. They just go ahead and then the government kind of like, okay, let's see what you guys are up to and then like see how it assimilate with the society. Well, everyone in China understands how to read the government. There's what's written, here's the law, and then there's here's what's enforced. And they don't always line up. Sometimes it's like, yeah, that's the law, but we're not worrying about it. It's fine. And then the government will actually give you a heads up. Look, within six months or a year, we're going to start enforcing this law. You can't smoke in restaurants. Mm. They kind of give people a heads up. So everyone kind of knows how to read the tea leaves very well. It's often very confusing for foreigners. Mm. Um, most people who are local kind of know what's up. Um, yeah. So and when you're when you should sort of okay, we got to stop. Uh, okay, so that's the the that that line, the fine line that the locals can identify pretty well. Um, but come to think about like just a few years ago when Jack Ma, who used to be like really, really famous and so-called the legendary right, in China, but because of something that he said that kind of upset the government, the whole entire situation changed. So do you think right now, um, do the does the government still give that kind of, you know, freedom of support to those tech companies, or right now they're actually more in control? I don't know. This was a media story for a long time that there was a tech crackdown. And in some cases, that was true. The whole Jack Ma story is not really, I don't think, very accurate as to what happened with Ant Financial. Um, yet there is a bit of now, my experience has been the government will generally give you a heads up. If you just read the Global Times, they're pretty open about what is okay and what is not. You'll get it. You'll understand. But every now and then there's a surprise. Um, the crackdown on education apps, where basically the whole sector was made nonprofit yep. in a day. If you had read Global Times, you would have been hearing government very vocal about the concerns about capital activity within the education space. That was not new. Mm. Okay, but what happened that day, that was pretty shocking to a lot of people. So there can be surprises, but people kind of know how to deal with it. Like I was like, the analogy I always make is like, if you live in Hong Kong, everybody understands hurricanes, right? Yeah. Every, everybody knows how to deal with it. We have That's certain- true. Right. So when a hurricane happens, it's not a, it, okay, we didn't see it, but we know what to do. So hurricanes don't hit Hong Kong in a major way. But when mm -hmm. a hurricane hits Louisiana, which hasn't had a hurricane in a decade, okay, you get flooding. A lot of China is like that. Like people just know how to deal with certain things that happen on a regular basis. They're used to it. So when a regulation maybe was a surprise, everyone knows how to pivot. And the education companies that got hit pretty hard, like New Oriental, you know, New Oriental went into live streaming and e-commerce and did, oh. did pretty well within wow. six months. So a lot of it's just being familiar with the terrain uh -huh. and that, you know, we know how to deal with the storm. That's very um, impressive. 
So talking about, you know, changing, uh, constantly adapting, you know, right now with the rise of other e-commerce platform like JD, which has been quite some time, but with Pinduoduo right now, right? Do you think that Alibaba itself as a company is losing its economic mold? I mean, the, the e-commerce space is, Alibaba has a tremendous mold. Mm. Marketplace platform, major network effects, uh, it's an incredibly strong business model, right? It's not like JD's business model, which is smaller. Yep. It's pretty much identical to Amazon. Mm. Um, very similar. They're a retailer and they're a marketplace. They have both. Alibaba is not a retailer. They don't sell anything themselves. They just help connections. So we know those business models. They're very powerful. Nobody has challenged Amazon in a decade. Yeah. Right? Okay. China is a little bit different because yes, the business model is very powerful, but e-commerce in China is more dynamic. Uh, the degree of competition is a little more fierce. You know, a lot of the, the B2C tech giants of the U.S. are very stagnant. Facebook mm. hasn't invented anything in a decade. Yep. Neither has Apple. Mm. Neither has Airbnb. Mm. Uh, they're very stagnant because they have these powerful moats. Yep. Uh, they can get away with it. Okay, having a powerful moat in China is not enough. You're going to still see, especially in e-commerce, you are going to see young guns like Pinduoduo, Zhang Yimin at ByteDance, you know, Colin Huang. Yeah. You're going to see these young junk guns come up and challenge you. And yeah, market share, you know, just because you were powerful five years ago doesn't mean you're going to be. And I actually like that. I like the fact that the e-commerce space is dynamic. Mm. We see Pinduoduo break in and yep. do very well. Yeah. And we saw ByteDance break in. Now they're going into e-commerce yes. and they're doing very well. Yes. Right? We don't see that in the U.S. and we definitely don't see it in Europe. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, you know, the joke I use is, E-commerce in the U.S. is like soccer. E-commerce in China is more like rugby. It's a bit more of a brutal sport. So, you know, Alibaba is a tremendous business. Mm -hmm. um, so is JD. So is Pinduoduo. So is TikTok Shop. So is WeChat Mini Programs, which is an mm -hmm. e-commerce. Yep. Yeah. And they're all fighting it out. And um, Alibaba has had to... Um, reorganize their business. Co-founder Joe Tsai has come back. So has Eddie Huang or Eddie Wu, the um, who was a co-founder CTO. The original founders have come back. Wow! And they are taking their they've taken the wheel. Um, so yeah, you've seen them respond to this in a good way. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same thing at JD, Robin, uh, Richard Leo, the co, you know, the founder, yes. he has come back in and is running the show again. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a lot, it's good. It's good for consumers. It's good for the competition. It's really impressive because like, okay, so right now with the apps, the Chinese apps being more and more widely adopted, do you think that it might also have the potential to challenge, let's say Amazon, you know, yeah. in the what do you think? If you had said that in 2015, the answer would be no. Um, the companies in China that go abroad and do very well were usually manufacturing base. Mm. Xiaomi was rocking and rolling in India and Southeast Asia, you know, 2015, 2018. So was, you know, Huawei. So mm -hmm. was, so we've seen Chinese companies go international and do very well in consumer electronics, TVs, things like that. We hadn't seen a Chinese app do that. WeChat had tried, it didn't work very well. Mm. And then TikTok came along and kind of went yeah. to the US and, and ran circles around Facebook, right? <laughs> and that changed the story. And a lot of companies are like, oh, interesting. And Kwai Show has tried to do the same thing. Um, and then we saw Shein do the same thing in e-commerce yeah. and sort of rocked Amazon a bit. Uh -huh. And then Timu did it. And yes. now uh, AliExpress Choice, mm -hmm. AliExpress is the 
international yeah. version. You know, they have a new um, service they call AliExpress Choice, which is basically five day delivery. They rocked their numbers in the fourth quarter. That was the story of Alibaba's recent earnings call mm -hmm. was AliExpress rocked it. And mm. they're doing real well in Spain. Mm. Um, I don't totally understand why Spain, uh, Poland, a little bit of Italy. Um, so yeah, um, the idea. And so we, we saw media, TikTok blazing everywhere. And now TikTok shop, which is e-commerce and TikTok, I think they're number one in Vietnam now. They're number two or number one. Wow. And they were making such waves in Indonesia. The government stepped in to basically create a new rule that said you can't do short video and e-commerce. You have to be separate, <laughs> which was kind of a BS rule. I, it was purely to protect Topicopedia. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, Chinese apps are uh, and now we've got cars. OK, cars are a lot of Europe is freaking out because Chinese EVs are coming in. Yes. But the EV links with the smartphone and it uh -huh. links with the smart home, right? That's Xiaomi. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah. It's yeah they're, they're, they're doing real well this year. We're seeing a regulatory response um, because companies are freaking out. And uh, when was the first year that you actually went to China? Like, how has China transformed w with you, you know, that like you staying there? I was I was flying between when I was working for the, the Saudi billionaire. I was flying between uh, the Middle East and China back in 2007. 2007. Um, and we were looking, we were working on projects. And the idea was going to build a skyscraper in Lu Jatsui, which didn't happen. Um and yeah, back then it was a little bit, there were fewer, you know, wide wool back then. You could go to certain bars in Beijing on a Friday night, the foreigner bars, and we would all see each other. Hey, hey, you know, um, San Li Tun uh, was a bit of a dicey area back then. There were certain bars in Shanghai people would go. To. We all kind of, most of us knew each other mm. um, in some form. Now there's, you know, now so there's many. a lot of why yeah. everywhere. So it's <laughs> different now, but back then it was, and then we used to live in Shanghai and people were in, not so many in Beijing. And then the Beijing Olympics happened in 2008. Yeah. And I was at the opening ceremonies. Wow. Um, I, I got some VIP ticket thing. So I was at the ceremony and like, you know, I could see the president and yeah. Putin was there. And uh, that was when, the, that was when the China story stopped being a story that business people knew. Mm. And pretty much the whole world started to know. That was mm. that was the day like my mom called and she's like, oh, China looks interesting. Like she had never <laughs> done that before. Right. <laughs> and now, you know, you know, five years later, 10 years later, everybody's then it became political. Yeah. Suddenly it's in the Washington Post. It was never in the Washington Post before. <laughs> so, so so yeah yeah how how interesting that how fast china transformed so if we ask the next question about you know this power struggle that for so many years people recognize the rising power of china and then they keep on saying that one day you know china is going to overtake and it's going to overtake us but somehow it still seems to be actually pretty far away so do you think that what kind of challenges do you think China is facing right now to kind of maybe slow down its growth a little bit? Uh, like I know like this population problem, people are not giving birth. Uh, what kind of problems yeah. do you think they're facing? Well, I mean, there's reality and then there's the narrative. And the media narrative is almost always wrong. Like I don't pay much like if you go on YouTube and type in China collapse, you'll see a whole suite of videos. China's going to collapse. Like, and then you can go back to 2015, type in China collapse. You'll see a whole thing. 2005, China. So there's these media narratives that are pretty stupid. Um, one is like, oh, it's going to collapse. Demographic time bomb. Um, 
you know, the real estate sector is going to collapse because Evergrande had bank. You know, I don't pay much attention to any of that, um, mm. usually because it's been wrong mm. forever. Mm. Um, and it's usually about getting clicks, right? Mm. Mm. Now, if you want to get what I think is real, um, just read annual reports from any company. Business people know what's going on. Mm. Investors know what's going on. So read annual reports for something like GM or yeah. Apple or Coca-Cola and read the China section of their 10Ks. And mm. you will get a very accurate picture because these people understand the business. They're mm. on the ground. They're running thousands of stores, right? They understand what's real and what's a bunch of phony stuff. Uh, if you read the 10Ks and read the China sections of any of these, you'll get a real good detailed understanding of what's real. And there are a couple real things. Um, the demographic slowdown is going to impact the long-term growth trajectories. Mm -hmm. That's true. Okay. So uh, you know, most people, if they're investing, they are redoing their growth projections 2030, 2035, and they're probably adjusting them down somewhat. So, we, you know, as population demographic gets older, you, you do see a slowing of growth. Mm. Okay, that's real. It's also real in Japan. It's real yeah. in Italy. Italy, the situation is very bad. Um, the U.S. doesn't have a problem with demographics, really. It's actually pretty good. Mm. Um so that's a common, that's real, and you should factor that into growth. Um, the debt, it's kind of a problem, but again, you know, look at the U.S. <laughs> I'm, in a US I'm an American citizen. The spending's out of control. Um, the real estate stuff is creates turbulence. That's nothing new, really. We've seen non-performing loans in real estate 25 years ago. I put that in the same category. I put the hurricanes, mm. credit defaults and credit problems associated with the real estate booms and busts is something that happens in China and has been happening for 25 years. Usually it's provincial or citywide. Mm. So that's hurricane. Yes, it's an issue, but it's one that everybody knows how to deal with. Um, there's been booms and busts in real estate at the local level going back to 1995. I am, and you know, government action is real. The government is actively involved in business in China. Okay, that's real. Um, that's, I always tell people like there's two dimensions. Is the government active versus passive? The US is very passive. Yep. China is much more active. Okay, the other dimension is stupid and corrupt versus smart. There's a lot of governments in this world that are active and incredibly stupid. Mm. That's a problem. Chinese government's really smart. They're not dumb. Like when I look at the regulations they rolled out for e-commerce, mm. um, they're incredibly well thought out. They're arguably the best regulations I've seen on tech anywhere in the world. Wow. India tends to be very active. Yeah. India jumps in any random day and says 200 apps are banned. And I find their regulations pretty stupid. <laughs> We're going to ban uh, Bitcoin and crypto trading and Web3. And now we're going to regulate the hell out of AI. And you've just convinced all of your software people to leave the country. Mm. Right. So yep. they're active, but I would say, look, it's now some of their stuff is pretty thoughtful, but a lot of it's really not smart. And, you know, I'm an American. Mm. The regulations we see out of the U.S. are incredibly stupid. California's regulations are so dumb. Um, they're, they're basically self-dealing. And the TikTok discussion is, yeah. is idiotic. Those aren't them. Those are like, it's a national security threat. Really? Kids dancing on their beds, really? It's all self-interest, right? It's yep. all it's all self-dealing. Uh, Facebook is having a great month. Um, <laughs> so you, you got to put all this in context. 
And I think you can assert that most of the major governments of the world are now active regulating technology. Scotland just passed a sweeping law that you can kiss free speech in Scotland goodbye. It's mm. gone. Mm. You can go to jail for life for saying something that offends people. Right? Like, so there's a lot of crazy stuff happening this year. So put it all in context, right? Mm. Um, so, but there's so, real things about China to be concerned about. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. However, in the long run, you believe that China, um, with the smart regulations, as well as um, the creativity innovation from different businesses, it's actually strong for long-term growth. Yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm, my concerns are, are completely outweighed by the positives, which are a very large market. Um, you know, e-commerce in China dwarfs. You take all the e-commerce spending of China, that's number one in the world. Number two would be the US. Then it's like UK, Japan. If you take two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, add them all up, money spent per year, it's less than China. The economy's huge, you know, 18, 20 trillion dollar economy versus the US. You have a tremendous population of highly educated people. You know, millions and millions of engineers come out of university every year, two million. Mm. The US graduates 250,000. Mm. Now they get a lot of immigrants, but generally speaking, you've got a huge number of highly educated people who are very ambitious. Like don't yep. kid yourself, super ambitious. Um, that's going to create a lot of stuff. So, mm. you know, I look for companies, right? I don't, I don't bet on economies. I look at companies and I can always find companies in China that are incredibly impressive. Look at BYD. You know who, I'm guessing, you know who worries Elon Musk? It's not GM, Ford, or Volkswagen. I, I would bet anything it's BYD. BYD, yeah. That dude, he's like, I mean, that guy's very impressive. Wang Chuanfu, that guy is incredibly impressive. I wouldn't compete with that guy for anything in the world. <laughs> he's a battery manufacturer who took over most of the world. And now he moved into cars. He's a metallurgist. Okay, Elon is a, you know, he's an AI and rocket guru. This guy's a battery guru. And mm. he's got almost 30 years under his belt as CEO of a technology company. I mean, he's the real deal. So is Lei Jun at Xiaomi. When mm. he said, I'm going to go into electric cars, like I told all my listeners, keep an eye on them. If anyone's going to surprise us in electric vehicles, it's this guy and his team. You know, he's been leading software companies since 1997. I mean, you don't you don't compete with that guy. Like, no, no, no. I wouldn't compete with Elon either. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't compete with that guy either. Uh, so yeah, people like this, it's like, yeah, you've got real serious players who are now veteran technologists who are on their third, fourth, fifth company now. Exactly. That's yeah. so much experience and so much scalability that they're looking at. So going back to an uh, Alibaba again, you know, like last year, they actually announced that they plan to split the company into six different business groups. Yeah. Um, and in your opinion, do you think it's actually, why do you think the company is doing this? And how would that be beneficial to existing shareholders? Yeah, I mean, they did two things, really. Um, they did a major reorganization, which was a big decision. This was not, this was a big move by Alibaba, which was we've got to break up into smaller units that are closely tied to their capital markets. And this will make us more agile. Basically, you can't sleep within the mothership anymore. Mm. You can't be a medium or small business within the behemoth of Alibaba and have a you know, relaxing life. Mm. No, you're on your own now. Like you're gonna be accountable to your shareholders and you can get rich or you can fail, but right? And, and you need both because if you're gonna get the best people, 
you got to give them the opportunity to build a team and get rich, right? So like the international division, the international e-commerce division, which is AliExpress, Lazada, uh, what's the other one? Just, I Demo. always forget them. There's two more. Um, you know, they have, you know, they were sort of on their own and they started, yeah, there it is. Sorry, thank you. Trendy all. <laughs> I always forget that one. Um, and there's another one too. Uh, starts with a D. I always forget that one. The one in Sri Lanka and uh, Dawa. Anyway. Breaking them out and reorganizing, that's an effective, if it works, it doesn't always work. But if it works, you can see operating performance increase. Moving. Mm. If it works, it's powerful. But the, the flip side to that coin is um, show me the people. Okay, I get the reorg, accountable, you know, show me the team. And over the next six months, they started to make major changes in their management. Daniel John, mm. out. Who's running the two most important divisions within Alibaba Domestic, which is Alibaba Cloud and Alibaba e-commerce? They replaced both teams. With mm. now it's Eddie Wu and Joe Tsai, I think, are running both, which is a little that's a, that looks like a temporary solution. Um, I've seen the international team, uh, James Dong and his team. Uh, he runs Lazada, and then the other guy runs impressive um we're starting to see the people being put into the chairs and um it looks pretty good it looks like the people you would want to see so you know before if you were like let's say you were an ambitious executive in hanjo and you wanted to rise up the ranks of alibaba well to do that you had to probably run tmall or taobao or cloud, right? But if they send you to Singapore to run, I don't know, Lazada, that's probably not a path. You know, you, you don't want to be sent halfway in the world. You want to be in Hanzhou. Well, now you can make a name for yourself there because you're sort of got your own business unit. You can get rich probably. So they've changed the dynamic. And if you would look at who had gone to run like Lazada, they had a new CEO every 12 months for years. They kept cycling people from Hanjo every 12 months. That's not what you want to see. Um, so the the talent picture and the incentives look much better. Hmm. But we'll see. My argument has been watch the international numbers. If any of the numbers are going to surprise us, I think I said this back in August, that would be the first one where we get evidence that this is working. Mm. and they popped their numbers in a little bit so because they were already set up they already had their team um the other we don't quite know who's going to run it can't be eddie Wu running global ceo e-commerce and cloud you can't that's no someone else is coming in wow probably that's that's very interesting. And, uh, and I think that's very good insights to look at the quarterly earnings to see whether it's the business improving. Then we know that the culture has it actually positively impacted Alibaba in, in, uh, in, in totality. Um, one of our listeners, Terry, is also asking, what do you think is Tencent's future is going to be like? I mean, Tencent is, you could argue that Tencent has the most powerful business model on the planet. Like, if you wanted to have that argument, that might be right. Like, it'd be one of the three. I mean, its business model is unbelievable, right? I mean, it's it's so good. Like, you know, it's gaming and it's messenger and it's payment. And now they're going into e-commerce and now they've, they're going into search, mini programs, mini games. And now they're going into short video and live. And it's like... You know, most people get one great, not most people, you're lucky if you get one great business in your company. They got like six. Yeah. It's totally unfair. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's like someone who's beautiful and a genius and rich. It's like, you got to have all three, really. You, you can't just be genius and not beautiful. Like, it seems unfair. Um, yeah, their business model is... Um, 
their biggest limitation is probably can they break out from China to the world? Mm. Right. She, I mean, she ended it. Yeah. Well, they were always kind of international. Pinduo Duo did it with Timu. Mm. Bite Dance, which is arguably the strongest competitor to Tencent, is Bite Dance. They broke out and went international. Yeah. Um, Tencent is mostly a domestic story outside yeah. of gaming. Yeah. Do they need it really? I mean, they're <laughs> so good domestically. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I thought like their e commerce play into the mini, that the mini programs really got my attention three to four years ago. I'm like, this is like a gangster move. If you can jump from like messenger and payment into basically e commerce, um, it's the ultimate Alibaba counter strategy. Um, and sure enough, if you looked at their GMV, they were growing at 90% a year for years. Like, like whenever you see lists of like the biggest e-commerce companies of the world or China, nobody ever lists Tencent. But they're probably number two, depending how you count the numbers, right? But they're never on the list. But yeah, their mini programs was friggin' genius. And mini games too. Like, yeah, wow. that kind of rocked Apple. Like <laughs> Apple's like, we've got the operating system for smartphones. It's like, no, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> You got trumped. Like <laughs> they jumped on top of you. That was genius. Yeah. I, I think sometimes I when I look at how Chinese they do their business, they really integrate it so well into people's life. It's just truly amazing. Um, moving on to our next question, which has to do with your past experience with Warren Buffett. I understand that in the past, you actually lead a group of students from Peking University to go to Omaha and then learn and meet directly with Warren Buffett. Can you share with us a little bit more about the experience? How was it like? Yeah, that's um, like everyone here is, a, I think everyone here is a businessman or woman or investor. You got to be a little crafty if you're going to be in business, right? You got to be a little tricky. Um, that was a little bit of a trick. Um, if you want to meet Warren Buffett, now it's, I mean, he doesn't do meetings much anymore, right? Uh, it's almost impossible because he gets thousand, you know, 30,000 requests per year. Um, the trick is he did meet up until recently with students. And of the student groups he wants to meet with, China was number one. Mm. I mean, he was very interested in China, very interested in Chinese students. So that's how I kind of, he didn't want to meet with me. I mean, he wanted to meet with Chinese students. So a little bit of a, it was me being a little crafty. Um, yeah, but we, we set up a thing and uh, they, they had a day, they bring all the students out from various universities, like five or 10 universities. And I brought the group out from Peking University, which is about 20 people. Um, but, you know, he would give a talk, Q&A, fine. We all have steaks at a steakhouse. But I kind of knew that he wanted to meet the Chinese students. So he gave a talk. All the students are sitting there. But we had a little table with Peking University. And like as he was wrapping up, I knew his assistant. And she came over and put a cherry Coke next to me on the table. And like anyone who's a Warren Buffett fan, I was like, wait a minute. Like I mean, I didn't. I was like, wait a minute. Like cherry Coke right next to me. No, Really? No. And sure enough, he's like, thanks, everybody. And he stands up and walks over and sits next to me, right? Wow. Which I didn't know was going to happen. But I figured it out with the cherry Coke. And yeah, that's like, okay, that was a little bit of luck. And uh, he ended up sitting for about two hours with our little table. And everyone was talking. And he was, you know, just every question you can, I ran out of questions. Um, and it was, it was unbelievable. And uh, I wrote it all up in huge detail. Um, and yes, then, I you know, that. six months later, I was kind of emailing his office. Um, and his office is actually very nice to deal with. He has one assistant. If you email a request to his assistant, you will get a reply within 24 to 48 hours. Wow. Like they're very good about it. Right. Now, the answer is going to be no. <laughs> to virtually everything, but it will be a very nice no. 
Um, anyways, and so we were doing that and I sent in some things and sure enough, I got a, one day I opened up my email and it's like, Hey, you know, this was great. Thanks for meeting. We're going to meet you and your team out and thing is, you know, sincerely warned. <laughs> right. If you ever get a Warren Buffett email and you're, no, he didn't type it, his assistant typed it, but I was like, oh my God, oh, you know, like, because I'm a fanboy. Uh, yeah. And it was, I brought another group out a year later and we did the same thing. And I was sitting with him again for a couple hours. Um, and then they, they ended all this when he turned 87 or something. Oh, I see. He, he started, they basically redid his schedule for the year and he doesn't do meetings like pretty much every, a lot of stuff stopped mm. um, and they dialed back his schedule. So that was kind of the end. So, yeah, that was one of those things where like, even like now it's like, oh, you're going to go to the Warren, but you know, the Berkshire Hathaway meeting in Omaha. Yeah. And I'm like, how am I ever going to top that? That's true. It's not possible. You're not the best. There's no way. I'm like, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm done. I peaked. <laughs> There's no way I can ever, but yeah, he, he really liked talking to Chinese students. That's how that happened. And I just happened to be the, you know, the guy sitting at the table with him. The um, bridge between the Chinese students, because you brought them over there, right? Yeah. Well, it wasn't just me. It was, there was other people at Peking University involved that had put it together. So no, it was, it wasn't just me. I was, that was a lot of luck. So, and from all the interaction, like two times, what is your greatest lesson from close interaction with Warren? I mean, I've written it all up. If you go to my webpage, jeffthausen.com and just type up Warren Buffett, I literally wrote up, because we spent several days, well, we would go there and we would visit some of his companies yep. and we would see, you know, and then we would have dinner with lunch with him and so on. So I've written it all up in glorious detail. Um, the My biggest takeaway was he's everyone knows he's really smart he's smarter than you think he is wow. that was my impression like sitting there sort of talking and listening and taking notes is he's much smarter than actually people think he is he's probably a little autistic or something because he would say things that like he would keep doing this like student would ask him something totally random, like, you know, you bought this company in 1970. Why, what, you know, you bought it for, you know, in early 1970, some random company, not a major one, like smaller one, retailer. Mm -hmm. why, why were you, you know, were you buying it at a discount? Why were you doing that? And I swear to God, this is what he would say. He says, well, no, I didn't, I didn't start buying in 1970. I started buying in December of 69. And we were buying it like $55 per share. Then in 1970, the price went up. And by the time we finished like February of 1970, we were buying it like $70 per share. Wow. And he would say, and you're like, how in the world do you possibly know that? And he would keep doing that. Like throughout the day, he would, oh, it's like, you know, so you met, you know, so-and-so like Bill Gates. And he, that's a story he tells a lot. So fine. But you're like, no, no, we met on a Tuesday. Yeah, it was a Tuesday and we met on, like we went to this restaurant, so-and-so. And, and he would keep throwing out details like this all through the, the conversations. And you're like, how smart are you? Like, that nobody's that smart. Like, and I talked to one of his CEOs within, you know, and he said the same thing. He's like, he remembers everything. Like, it's spooky how he can bring up numbers from a decade ago for our business that we don't even know. So there's something, wow. I think I, if I had to guess, I would say he's a little autistic or something because he can do things that even, we all know smart people in this world. He's a level above, something's going on. Um, yeah, that was spooky when he kept doing that. It's cool, but it was spooky. Oh, well, you know, another one, I'll tell you another one because I don't think people know these stories. Like I asked him about, oh, you you invested and in, he made two China investments. He bought BYD in 2008 mm -hmm. and PetroChina in like 2003 or something. Yeah. And I asked him, because everyone knows BYD, but people don't know PetroChina. I said, how did you find that deal? Was Did Li Lu bring you that deal like he brought you BYD? And he goes, no, no, I, I, that was on a Sunday. I was just reading the annual report on my sofa. 
And uh, it was, I read the annual report on the sofa and 45 minutes later, I, I made the call and bought it. Wow. He that was just reading detail. annual reports on his sofa on a Sunday. And in 40 minutes, he made the call and bet and he, he made the purchase. And that investment, which was like $200 million, turned into a 9x return in two to three years. Mm hmm value investors don't make nine X like I'm like, that's weird. Like um, I never hear of value investors doing something like that. So something a little spooky going on. It's like a movie that he literally just remembered a scene. Oh my gosh. I think he actually, people have told me, and I don't know if it's not, if it's true, those came from him. So I believe it. People have told me that he just reads annual reports and he remembers all of it. Wow. He just, that's what he does. He just reads them and not, maybe not all of it, but like if he cares, I think a huge amount of it is just there in his mind, which most people can't do that. Right. Yeah. He so has photographic memory. <laughs> I don't even know if it's photographic. I think it's just operating photographic memory. People can see it in their mind. I don't think it's that. I think it's something autistic where he, it's just, he just knows it. Like autistic people don't have photographic. I think they just know it. Wow. I think maybe, I don't know. I'm guessing. I don't know. Uh -huh. But that, that jumped out at me. Like after a couple of times him doing this, I'm like, this is weird. Um, mm. You know, Bill Gates can't do that. Elon Musk can't do that. You know, hedge fund managers who are, everyone knows are like incredibly smart. They can't do that. Like, this is something different, maybe a little different going on here. Very interesting. And talking about Lilu, um, do you, have you met him in person before? Um, I've been to his office. I don't know him well, but um, his company, Himalaya Capital, is based in, in Pasadena. I've known some of his staff because his staff is a lot of Chinese, right? Yeah, And he actually, his company, Himalaya Capital, Li Lu, and some of his staff, they actually used to teach a course. They may still do it at Peking University. Ooh. So they would be right down the hall from me when I was teaching. Uh -huh. um, so I actually would walk down the hallway when it was usually not Li Lu, it was usually his COO or something. Uh, but I knew some of his researchers and well as well. So I would go to their offices in Pasadena and uh, they would maybe email me about a Chinese company because they've been hunting Chinese companies. Yeah. Like all the time. And his team, I think they're all Chinese or Chinese American or most of them or something because mm -hmm. uh, they're very good on the ground in China. Like if you see the Himalaya capital people on the ground looking at a company in China, that's a good tip. Like keep an eye out for anything like they're doing there. Because I knew they were looking at a couple companies in China and I looked at them. I'm like, ooh, they, they're really good at this, right? Uh -huh. uh, but no, I don't know. Really yeah. Really particular. I think I've said hi to him in the classroom once or twice, but that's it. Because like Munger has like like so much trust in Lilu and, and he also put some of his money to get Lilu to help him to invest, right? That's really amazing. Well, wow. when, I, when I was asking Warren about China, because he wanted to talk about China. Yeah. And he was looking for company ideas. He was telling the students. And he said at the time he was reading China Vanka and he was looking at insurance companies in China. So real estate and insurance, because he was looking for something large, right? He needs large companies. There's not that many um, Chinese real estate insurance, big company. And he was looking at, at um Vanka, you know, Wang Shi. So for yourself, like, do you have any um, advice that you want to give to um, people who maybe want to get started their investing journey or maybe interested in looking into China? What's your advice for them? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm micro. Like, I think people freak out about China. I think it's it's viewed as foreign or different. If, you, if you're not, you haven't lived there on the ground. Um, I generally tell people, don't worry about it. Like, it's, if you were in auto and you wanted to learn semiconductors, which if you're in auto, you kind of might have to, you would recognize, okay, I'm going to have to learn a new sector. 
I'm going to have to learn the tech. I'm not going to understand some of it. I'm going to have to understand the industry. I'm going to have to learn a lot. And I know it'll take me some time. And But I think if I do this for, in a couple of years, I think I could be pretty good. Right? It's the same as that. Right? If you want to understand, let's say, in, now, I think in a lot of businesses, you have to understand China. You can't understand GM without understanding their China business or Coca-Cola or Starbucks. So it's kind of becoming required. Um, I, I would say don't freak out about it. Like you pick a sector, start with sector, not geography. If you want to be a healthcare person or a hospital person or a digital tech guy, pick your sector. That will tell you, okay, you probably got to understand the US, China, uh, and you'll take it apart. Just study companies. You'll take it apart. Ignore the news. Like, forget all that. Like, the only thing I really read is uh, I read annual reports and I read short reports. Mm. Right? Yes. That is very helpful. Um, and if I can talk to management, I talk to management. I don't really look at anything. I don't read the news at all, really. Well, I mean, I do it because I influence a little bit, but I, I don't pay much attention to it. Um, if you want to understand like KFC in China, read Yum China's annual reports. They talk very specifically about what they're doing on the ground, opening here, closing there. We're putting in kiosks here and we're doing on-demand delivery there. And it's it's very granular, um, pretty easy to understand. I would say maybe as a caveat to what I just said, the B2C side of China is relatively easy to understand. You can see people walking into luck in coffee or not. Mm. The B2B side, it's a little bit of a black box because if this industrial company does contracts with these SOEs to supply them with aluminum, you don't really know what's in those contracts. It's a you can't really get at it. Mm. Like, what crazy terms did you put in these purchasing agreements that I don't know about? Uh, but if it's B2C, you can kind of go to the mall and figure it out. It's a little easier to tease it out. Um, certain aspects of China, industrial, SOEs, it's kind of a black box. Uh, hospital purchasing, um, a lot of strange behavior happening there. Um, so certain sectors, I don't, I, I like the B2C side a lot more. Mm. Um, so start with something that, we as a consumer, we can observe so that we it's also easier for us to get started this research journey. Is that right? Yeah, you can verify things, mm. right? You always want at least two pieces of information. Okay, management says they're opening 10 stores and, and they're doing fine. All right, let's go walk to the stores and see if anyone's there. Let's go look at the payment information. Let's look at the credit card reports. Let's look at something where we can get a second piece of information to know that, okay, that's real. A lot of B2B stuff, you can't really verify it. Like, you know, if they say they're shipping into Indonesia, fine, let's go look at the import reports for Indonesia. You yeah. know, we can we can check. Um, hard to get a read on some of that stuff. Uh, I like B2C um, in China and the digital story there is very cool. So it's fine for me. If people ask me what's going on in, you know, industrial internet. I look at case studies, but I don't really know. What contracts is Alibaba Cloud really doing on the enterprise side within China? Now they will tell you a revenue number. What are the payment terms? What are the liabilities? I don't know. I can't see the contracts. Wow. Thanks for sharing because once again, it's a good reminder for us to stick with something that we understand so that we can have a better verification process to also hone up our research ability. Um, so if people want to find out more about your work um, and even follow you, where should they go to? Um, it, I mean, there's content and then there's consulting. If you want to talk consulting stuff, we do that all the time. We do tech strategy analysis. This company is going to do well. This one's not. Sometimes for a client, sometimes for an investor looking at a company. Uh, that's just techmoconsulting.com. Again, easy to reach us there. Um, on the more analysis and you know, in writing, uh, probably the easiest thing is you can go to jefftausen.com and there's an email sign up there. Or there's, there's like, I don't know, 800 articles 
or something there, just search and companies will come up. Um, or there's a podcast, just do a tech strategy podcast. You know, I talk for an hour every week about various, how to think about digital. Usually it's, it's about companies. Here's a deep dive in Baidu. Or it's, here's how to think about tech strategy. Here's how to think about these business models. So it's a little bit of teaching, like lectures on how to think about these models um, as opposed to a traditional business. That's great because sometimes like because you have so much experience into analyzing tech businesses, it's so much easier for you to elaborate. And because you have you have a lot of teaching background, I can see that you're very passionate about teaching as well. So that's why it's easier for the audience to comprehend and, and go further from there. So thank you so much once again, Jeffrey, for being here. And can we, oh, wow, some of our listeners, they say it's fascinating. Maybe we can get our listeners to also type down what is your greatest learning uh, from this past one hour of golden sharing from Jeffrey. Feel free to put it in the chat. Again, both of us are very, very curious to learn as well see what you guys have been learning i believe you won't be going to berkshire right because you already have the highlight <laughs> i want to go because you know things are we've only got a couple years left let's i mean let's not to be morbid but mm -hmm. we're in the, you know we're in the end the last years of these meetings probably so i'm probably gonna go i think maybe not this year mm -hmm. it's a little bit sad but yes it is well i i think this year is kind of be quite special because even Buffett is asking shareholders to go. So let's see. I will be going. I, I will be uh, yeah, seeing what's going on there as well. So hopefully I can get to meet you in person one day. Anytime. I'm in uh, I'm either in Southeast Asia, like Bangkok, Singapore, or Beijing, Shanghai. That's oh. kind of my stomp, my little stomping wow. ground. Oh, that's great. I'm based in Singapore. I would love to connect yeah. with you for the next a time. Of, a lot here. of tech companies in Singapore now. That's getting real. That's on my rotation now. Wow. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. And so many people say that they had they had such a great learning. Thanks so much for your insightful sharing. So thank you so once once again, Jeffrey. And uh can't wait to learn more about your work. Uh just like what Jeffrey said, go to his website, jeffreydowson.com. There are so many articles that he really write very in-depth on. And his podcast is amazing as well. Go and listen so that you also increase your business sense and uh, ability to analyze those tech companies. Thank you, everybody. See you.